fell into a pit and we <laughs> never. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I don't even know what to our, do with them. Uh, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to our Fireside Chat series um, for the Animation Guild. My name is Patrick Rieger, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the Writers Crafts Committee of the Animation Guild. Um, a couple of quick things I wanted to mention, and then we'll get straight to our panel tonight. Um, if you're watching this video after we're finished the recording, and you're a writer but aren't in the Animation Guild yet, and you're a part of an animated series. Please check out the Animation Guild. It's animationguild.org. Um, if you are a writer and a member of the Guild and um, you haven't checked out the Craft Committee yet, please consider checking out our monthly meetings. Our next one is September 30th, and we're always looking for volunteers to help out. Um, this is the fourth in our Fireside Chat series. Uh, we have a, a, another set of them on the, on the website for the Animation Guild. And this one's all about comedy writing. And I couldn't be more excited to have um, a very special guest as our moderator. Uh, she has written on The Simpsons, on Archibald's Next Big Thing, and she runs one of the best uh, comedy panels in Los Angeles, the JP Lecture Series. Uh, it's my honor to welcome Julia Prescott. Oh man, thanks so much for that introduction, Patrick. And it's such an honor to be asked to moderate this. Um, you know, I've been a proud member of the Animation Guild for a handful of years now, and I love what you guys do. I love these fireside chats. Um, I feel, I mean, now that there's more on Zoom, I'm able to attend more of these meetings. And so that's been a positive light in uh, the pandemic darkness, I will say. <laughs> so um, thank you. And I'm so excited for our panel today. Um, these are all writers that I have known for a while, have worked with, have had the pleasure of sharing a writer's room with occasionally and every time it's it's a real joy and um yeah i just i i love the way each and every one of their brains work and i can't wait to dive into our discussion today um so without any further ado and i know you guys have already been kind of introduced to us as we talked about air purifiers and cats <laughs> but let's do a professional introduction because they deserve it um <laughs> and and when i introduce you just do a little wave um, she was a writer on Big Hero 6 at Disney. Um, she was part of the Rugrats reboot at Nickelodeon. She also uh, sold a show to Fox. It's an animated show, so it makes it even better, uh, called Saloon. Please welcome Jenny Jaffe. Yay! She has a dog named Spoof, another important thing to <laughs> know about her. <laughs> Um, she was a writer on Netflix's Last Kids on Earth, a uh, writer on the upcoming Harriet the Spy, also on Netflix, correct me if I'm wrong, yes, yes, uh, I feel like, Apple. whoa, I was, I was just about to say, like, 80% of everything is on Netflix now, but this is a fair, honestly, fair shot, Apple and, has money, too, you're talking <laughs> um, and you were also a writer on the Powerpuff Girls reboot, yeah. Right, yes. Uh, Haley Mancini. Um, she was a writer on Costume Quest, Littlest Pet Shop, and DreamWorks Peabody and Sherman Show. Kara Lee Burke is here. Yay. I have to talk now that it's in the chat. So, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, but not leastly, she was a writer on Steven Universe, Craig of the Creek, and My Little Pony, Pony Life. Um, Tanika Stotts is here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome. Um, so I uh, wanted to start this panel discussion in the way that I start um, all of my panel discussions um, for the JP Lecture Series and beyond, um, which is with the question, why are you so funny? Anyone just jump in and answer. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not because the I'm question. depressed. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I, I wrote that as a joke question, but maybe if there's, you know, any meat on that bone, uh, why do you think uh, you are attracted to a career in comedy writing? I wasn't. I was literally writing comics in my house and I got a call through my agent that was like, hey, are you interested in writing for TV? And I was like, hey, is this a scam? Um, my agent was like, no, it's, it's a legit offer, I think. Let me get back to you. Uh, and then she got back to me two days later. It was actually from TV. I was like, wow, the real TV. 
Um, and then the next thing I knew, I ended up moving from Portland, Oregon, where I had lived for the last 13 and a half years and started writing for animation. So there you go. I'm not funny. <laughs> you are funny. That's amazing. Was that for Craig of the Creek or Steven Universe? That was Universe? for Steven Universe, actually. Wow. Uh, Steven Universe Future uh, with Rebecca Sugar. Uh, Rebecca was reading samples and liked a web comic that I did by the name of Love Circuits, which is about a 25-year-old woman who gets a refurbished mandroid sent to her house and uh, funny things ensue. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it was something that I was doing as a side project. And yes, it, it, it's, it's a rom-com, uh, a sci-fi rom-com. And that's actually how I got into writing for animation. I love that. I didn't know that. Love it. Uh, how about the rest of the panel? Let's broaden this question out or maybe specify it to be what was your start in comedy writing? I will say I became a comedy writer for TV um, thanks to one episode of 30 Rock um, where Jack, I had been doing improv and sketch comedy since college and I, that was like my main thing. I went from Detroit to New York and was working in that world. And there was an episode of 30 Rock where Jack asked Liz, like, where do you see yourself in five years? And she's like, I don't know, like teaching improv on a cruise ship. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's going to be my life. I <laughs> need something that's more job-like. And then a friend of mine got me into like writing specs and uh, pilots and then took it from there. That's great. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I was literally boarding <laughs> a cruise ship like, and I looked I down at my head. We were on cruise ships doing improv. And, and I, there's nothing I, wrong I, with I, that. I was of them because it paid a lot of money, so. Those things do yeah. pay a lot. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick's here, again. <laughs> Hi, new friend. Hello. Hi, Lenny Uli here. Except I'm coming, I'm coming in under Patrick's I, I gave you a link to the panelist side. Let me move you to the attendee uh, side. Um, and you're also under my name. It's very confusing. I imagine how I feel. I'd like to know how you got into TV, specifically <laughs> this TV right in front of me. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let's see what else he's got going for me here. You guys, I planned this. Um, you know, <laughs> comedy is all about surprise and uh, surprise. <laughs> um, if it's only is comedy if it happens two more times, Julia. I know, I know. So let's try and make it happen two more times. Jenny, <laughs> how'd you get started in comedy writing? Um, I got started pretty young. I went to uh, this sort of like small local college called NYU, and I uh, I went to. Uh, Tish for TV writing, and there's its own, there, that school has its own cult of comedy writers. Yeah. Um, or aspiring comedy writers, and there's a group there called Hammercats that was, like, my home base as far as, like, that's where I, that was, like, my comedy boot camp, I guess, and we performed all around the city. Um, and right before my senior year of college, uh, I was uh, asked to uh, somebody, somebody saw a show I did or a sketch I wrote or, or something, and um, I was hired as a writer and cast member at College Humor. So that was like my entry point into the world of um, professional writing. And then I wrote for Late Night for a while, um, and then had a very weird, I think uh, Julia knows this story, but um, weird uh, foray into the nonprofit world for two years. I started a non a uh, teen mental health nonprofit uh, that's ongoing today, projectyouareok.org, if you're interested. Um, but uh, in that time, I had this moment of like, I've only ever been in comedy writing. I don't really know if I'm ever going to get back into TV again. I don't totally know what I want to be doing in TV again. And through a series of very random circumstances, ended up getting put in touch with Mark uh, McCorkle and Bob Schooley at Disney, who brought me, who moved me, I moved to LA to uh, work on Big Hero 6 uh, almost four years ago now. And um, animation was sort of an, uh, an accident, but I really found that I loved it and that it fits my sensibilities because I think I am like somebody who's drawn to like writing, I want to write goofy things, I want to write visual jokes, I want to, yeah. um, uh, 
sort of write these uh, sto- like more fantastical stories, I guess. And so uh, it worked, it worked out, but it's uh, so I should have stopped. Like I should have stopped five seconds ago, but I didn't. No, you're great. <laughs> Throw it over to you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And Haley, what about you? Um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I majored in mathematical economics, uh, <laughs> and then I graduated. <laughs> into- <laughs> I love it though. I mean, there are so many writers that majored in math. I know. Yeah, there's actually there's a lot of people that is but just writing a script. Drop out. Fair. To I mean, well, I, I but I was gonna say like there is so many mathematical elements of arranging story structure and arranging a script. Oh, there definitely are, and I've gotten in internet arguments about it before. Oh, great. I just <laughs> I just think it's not fair because I consider I like I try and make myself feel better. Like, well, at least I can write because I am abysmal at math. <laughs> <laughs> it is same. It 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 is insane. I cannot memorize a phone number. That's how bad I am with numbers. So the, then you're like, oh man, no, there are people who are just that cool and smart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Haley, you're cool and smart. What? <laughs> well, there weren't any jobs in it, so it doesn't really matter. Because <laughs> like I graduated, and then there was like, whoa, all these companies have gone under. Uh, so like the one place yeah. I had to do for like box like boarded up. <laughs> And then I was like, but I had also majored in, in theater, so I was like, eh, fuck it, I'll try to, oh, uh, or freak it, uh, I'll try to move to I think LA. you could fucking cuss in here. Okay, cool, all right, uh, only, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, I, uh, so I moved to LA, and I, I just, people pulled me into it, like, there was just people that were like, I don't know, you were always pretty funny in college, you want to do this improv show, and then that just kind of led to doing improv and sketch and then I uh got on you know like house teams at, at UCB and then I, I left for two years and did Boom Chicago in Amsterdam and performed there and uh and then I I came back and I was like hosting stuff and I and uh, I was hosting a show with Damien Fahey and we both talked about how we both wanted to start writing more and literally like the same week he started on Family Guy and I started on Powerpuff. It was like the oh. show got canceled. And the next week we both just kind of landed on stuff. So I did like sketch writing for a long time and kind of figured out my paces and had some really cool mentors to help me. But I think I, I wanted to do comedy. I, I think I just really wasn't confident enough that that was like a, a career path for me. Cause right. I, yeah. Yeah, because there's not like the set entry point of say, majoring in math and then like you have that sort of bridge of here's where you go and right. it's a little also, bit more of a grab bag i'm from denver too so it's not like they're like ah denver the home of comedy like, right well, <laughs> it's because I mean, you're now now you're from there <laughs> and so it is and i'm wearing a um, uniform yeah. uh, <laughs> so enough about the past guys i want to talk about right now um, what, if any, new coping mechanisms have you adapted to during this pandemic um, in, you know, your creative life, in just your general productivity? Um, what have you found to be surprisingly helpful during this time? <laughs> well, I will say I'm like, as we speak, waiting for an Ativan to kick in. So I... <laughs> that counts. That counts. Me, I lar- it's, I have a largely pharmaceutical element to it, but um, I think that like they, I mean, it's it's just like such a crazy thing because it's like not only are you adapting to the pandemic, but also if you're in California, you know that we're on fire. So it's little stuff like I have we have a detached um, uh, ADU at our house, and uh, that's usually my uh, office when I'm working from home. Uh, and it's not insulated well enough for me to be in there because I can't breathe. So I am currently in like one of the only two rooms where we have an air filter, which is like, so mm-hmm. I'm sitting on the bed and I've been literally sitting on the bed working most of the day. And um, you just sort of like, it's just weird things to adapt to. I did a pitch where um, one of the people uh, on the pitch was in, uh, Ukraine and one was in Canada and then a bunch of us were in LA and two people were in New York and it was just like 
it's just all new stuff and you just kind right. of, I think, and I think the kind of comforting thing is to, um, be like, we're all, none of us have done this before. So mm -hmm. the best we can do is give each other a little bit of space. And if I get a little less work done than usual, like if I get like, I used to be like all about productivity and very, really prided myself on like page count stuff. And these days I'm truly like, I'm going to try and get work done today. If I need to just do build Lego and watch um, Married at First Sight for a couple hours, that's what I'm going to do because yeah. And that's it, okay. It, like, yeah. So yeah, that counts. I mean, I binged all of that too. Who among us didn't? <laughs> Spectacular. Yeah. Anybody else have you guys found anything, um, you know, new and, and surprising and staying creative during COVID times? I grew up online, so I'm doing <laughs> the same thing that I was doing before pandemic That's happened. Still good. <laughs> Being a from Ventrilo, talking to my friends, bragging some noobs, and having a great day. Thank you. I mean, like. <laughs> There's really nothing else to do. It's like there's just more 40-year-olds and 12-year-olds playing the same games that I played. So right. my, my coping mechanisms are hanging out with my friends, scheduling Discord movie nights, and pretty much shuffling every run around and making sure that everyone's safe. I don't really have much else other than to be that kind of person in this kind of timeline because <laughs> everything else is kind of going on and it's going bad for a lot of other folks. Um, I don't really have that same issue, but I have that same concern for right. making sure that my general people that are around me or the people that I want around me can get here safely. So mm -hmm. I'm just more focused, if anything. I feel like I'm more hyper fixated on getting a lot of stuff done and making sure that uh, my family is taken care of, my wife is taken care of, things are just set in order. Um, if anything, it just kicked into gear all those things that I wasn't doing beforehand to make sure that I'm prepared. So maybe that's my coping mechanism. I'm just like, <laughs> hey, now I'm like, Captain, I can do everything. You want me to fix that light bulb, sweetie? I got it. You never know yeah. if the lights might go out. <laughs> like, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But also, um, just in general, it's, it's really cool to just like, I don't know, just have stuff in order and, um, Oh, for the better days, because, man. Yeah, I'm they're coming. Really, really like them to come back right about now. Um, they're coming. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. I mean, it's okay to be barely surviving, and it's okay to be thriving, Tanika. I think that you're living proof of that. <laughs> I feel like I oscillate day to day. Like, some <laughs> days I'm very, like, writing takes longer to get in the zone, but once I'm in the zone, it's like an escape, and it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm not in the real world right now. And then on other days, I just can't even get into it. And it's like, okay, this is an animal crossing day or a crafting day. Um, and uh, those things are fine too. And I, um, yeah, I, it's been really, I mean, until an injury, uh, I feel like I was very active as well. Like I had right. like YouTube yoga videos and I play a, like the fitness uh, video game and- Ring Oh, uh, Ring Fit? I love it. That thing is not messing around. I oh, was like, the best. I'm like a very, I do like Peloton and Pilates and yoga and I just did, <laughs> and I like, I, I, I was not prepared for the intensity of flame hair, squatting that much. Like I, I was in pain. I was like, this is a real workout. Yeah. Way. I would actually was just talking about it today. I have a, you guys can't see it, but I have a big old uh, brace on my leg. I totally um, broke part of my leg on a Zoom call, um, which is why I will stay seated for this one. But I, we were at the doctors and I was like, so how long into PT do you think they'll let me start doing ring fit again? <laughs> There's a lot of squats. Can I modify it? I'm getting to it. I had this weird escape to like go to this like video game world and, and, and live there and create my world on Animal Crossing and work out there. And I've seen it. My husband oh, just bought it and I'm with obsessed it? with it. If you can also it, just dance like, to be awesome. automatic. Oh, so wait, say that again? Yeah, if you go into your settings on your Ring Fit, it's in the disability settings actually. Uh, you can actually set the legs to be automatic, therefore you actually don't have to. It's for anybody who has <laughs> knee pain or can't actually 
uh, use those actual areas of their body. Oh, uh, nice. It's for everyone as far as like disability is concerned. It's ADA yeah. compliant for a lot of other folks, but it still has a little bit of issues sometimes with the tension band when you can't fully use your legs. You're obviously using those muscles. Anyway, I'm going to a full talk about ring fit. Anyway, I love it. It. I mean, I love it. Topic, but this was very, very informative. Thank you. We, yeah, we should probably talk about comedy soon, but I'm my mind is like I almost got the, the ring is so funny. Oh, no. I really like this pitch a ring fit show. It's fine. Okay. Also, <laughs> I'm sorry, down I, I, I gotta jump in and say Just Dance is dope. Yeah. yeah I just don't dance. know about Just Good. Dance. I love it. Need it. more K pop. Just gonna say. Yeah, K pop. Yeah, K pop. <laughs> yeah, de- you could always I, use more K pop. It's only got two K pop songs Blackpink and another one. Like, eh, yeah. I, I need I need variety in my life. Yeah. <laughs> All um, right. Great. Do we really need this one? I just really want to. I, I wanted to throw this in there real fast because I said it would before we were recording and all this, but it might be of use to somebody. Uh, my coping, I had to learn how to cope with two things I have ADHD and then I, I have migraines. So, uh, you realize when you're in the writer's room, uh, you're like when you're in the actual room with everybody, you're not staring at your screen the whole time, you're right. in a with people you're looking around you can even get up and move around and all that stuff and like for me it was a really jarring thing to go to being like I mean our story editor on Harriet and so then sometimes just running the room and having to stare into the screen and the biggest thing for me that was really difficult was was this focusing on the screen and I said this at the very beginning but the uh, these I bought these blue blocker glasses and they have really helped with the migraines. So if anybody is watching this and has gets migraines, because um, that was killing me. It was like yeah. the beginning of this. I I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was like, I don't I don't I don't know how I can continue with this. And I know other people have experienced it. So if you have eye problems or anything like that, um, that this has worked for me for as a coping mechanism. That's, and if that's you great. already wear glasses and they don't have blue blocker, I have a blue blocker screen on top of my screen and it has helped tremendously with headaches. Wow, I didn't even know that that was a thing. Damn. Yeah. I've had to leave in-person writer's rooms because of migraines. So like this has been like a really insane uh, challenge. And then with the air quality, it's just like, I've been down yeah. not so often. Well. Oh. Ooh. You guys are here now, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm happy. Um, let's talk about comedy writing and the specifics of, um, I know a lot of you guys have written across a multiple subgenres, um, you know, pre-K, uh, 6 to 11, bridge shows. Um, any, this open to anyone that wants to jump in. What is the difference between when you're stepping into a pre-K show or versus 6 to 11? Like, is there a flippy switch in your brain of like, I'm going to be focusing on this kind of comedy writing or is writing just writing? And you just walk in and open yourself to the experience. Anybody? I, think I it's tend to think that the language is different, but I'll let Haley speak upon it. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I uh, thank you. I was just gonna say, to me, I kind of think about it in terms of different, the different theaters I would perform at. Like I, if I would perform at, uh, you know, if I perform at more of the adult shows like Upright Citizens Brigade or Groundlings, but I also am a member, member of Story Pirates where we go and we perform kids' stories back to them. Yeah, it's a great to- board. Yeah, it's really fun. And so you and you can catch any of their stuff online. You can catch their podcasts online. So if you're looking for pre-K, I think actually looking at Story Pirates is a really good jumping off place. And that's kind of what I did. And I found that that helped me a lot because it's like, oh, you're using a kid's story back to them. Stay in that lane. That that helped me to age down. Mm-hmm. I, I like visual. Feel, oh. <laughs> I feel like being visual is very highly impactful when I'm using uh, anything from that pre-K world and I age it up with the the verbiage that's not speaking down to kids but speaking to right. kids um, the higher the age bracket it goes and uh, just having that understanding that even though they're pre-K they still understand words um, <laughs> being able to mix the two I still lean a little bit heavier on visual because it's just fun and it's better impact and I can uh, stretch the animators a little bit more thin. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, admittedly don't have pre-K experience to speak to, but as far as 
most of my students is either bridge shows or adults um, or a little bit of six to 11. And I, I think the biggest difference is actually network to network. Mm -hmm. I actually think that there's the, if consistent, cause I, I do think consistently what Tanika said is, is totally right. Uh, consistently across net, um, uh, age brackets, it's about speaking to your audience as people and, and, uh, not underestimating their intelligence and, um, and just telling the story in the best possible way. Um, and then I think within different networks, there'll be different um, types of comedy that they're more comfortable with. Um, or just that, um, you know, you just, you just sort of titrate your voice to ti the tiniest bit. Like, you, I know I can get away with this here. I know they're not right. gonna let me get away with this here. Like it's it, in, uh, in kids, the biggest difference is just, um, S and P at different places because I, I think otherwise it's like if you're telling the story to a six to eleven year old audience correctly um, and thoughtfully, there's not going to be a reason for you to want to say anything you wouldn't say to a six to eleven year old. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and then if you're you know doing something a little more. Um, edgy or raunchy you can like that's then that's part of the story it all mm -hmm. it all like, comes from uh yeah yeah i, I would feel, say uh oh sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say i feel like um across the board it's the same base theme of like identity and isolation right every you know group demo has those common themes of somebody is looking for their identity or they feel isolated or they're feeling they're wanting to be a part of a community and i've seen that you know shown in pre-k six to eleven and then you get to adults and it's just about the language and the way you shape those sort of common themes mm -hmm. which i think is yeah basically what but i mean i to. think personally and like uh i would say this even if tanika was not on the call i think steven universe is the most successful show about talking about trauma mm -hmm. uh, of any show across genres. Um, I, and like, I just feel like it, that's the show that really covered such a huge variety of really difficult topics in like the most interesting, funny, visual and age appropriate ways. And it's, and it wasn't lost on the audience. Um, yeah. and that's like, that's just a really great example of, um, sort of like the universality of, uh, of comedy and of those themes. Mm -hmm. Kara, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to talk about uh, the fallacy of the age group thing. I've mostly, on the shows I've written for, I've written for adult stuff and I've written for mostly yeah. 6 to 11 stuff. And I've developed for younger. And what I've noticed, just like what people are looking for more in younger is just more of that, what is the formula of the episode? And right. A lot of times, like, is there an activity that's part of it um, in, the, in the younger space? Um, but I, the only times I've ever really worked in the younger kids space was internationally. So mm -hmm. last year I had two jobs. One took me to Denmark and one took me to Italy. And in both of those, they were younger shows, but they didn't feel younger because they were, especially in Denmark, where it's like, they're just darker. And like, mm -hmm. they were willing to talk about real issues in a younger show because they weren't playing to a network. They were, you know, they could do whatever they wanted. And I, it was just like this, such a thing of, then I come back here and I start developing in that same age group and I'm getting pushback of like, well, kids can't handle it. I'm like they can, it's, you can watch it on, on all these different things, but it really is like looking at what each network is wanting. And also some of that, like how I like pushing, like I'm going to, if I use a formula, I'm going to mess with that formula. Um, even in a younger kids thing. And like, if you don't want that, then I don't need to work on your show. It's fine. You know, like, right. Uh, because I don't, I, I, as Tanika was saying, like, not talking down to kids, I think is the biggest thing. And I think sometimes not to speak bad about executives, but sometimes executives can want you to speak down a little bit more to them. Wait, we're not speaking. Kara, I'm going to give you a note right now. Do not be didactic <laughs> about the executives. Um, no, I've uh, never heard a bad thing about an executive ever. No. This is I'm new. This is available to too better tonight. <laughs> I am shocked, and offended, 
in the name of all executives, <laughs> I will be a vi now, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Thank you for bringing up Steven Universe. Uh, that is uh, powered by Rebecca Sugar, a hundred percent, a thousand percent. Um, I got a master class in writing and comedy and editing and everything just by being in the room with Rebecca. But it's not only just Rebecca, it's also the storyboarders. Um, yeah, let's talk about yeah. On a storyboard driven show and not absolutely talk about the amazing writing that came out of the storyboarders who were present in the room. Uh, they could have just been pitching in on the outline, the premise, or giving us a few base facts. But when it came down to actually writing the lingo and the language of the script, I didn't do my first scripted show until I went to Hasbro to work on Pony Life with Julia. Up until that point, uh, the scripting had been done by the script assistant, if we even had one, <laughs> Cartoon Network. Um, and then for, um, uh, we had to wait on uh, the storyboarders to pin up their boards and pitch their episodes. It's a, it's a different world when you go from scripted, non-scripted, back again, back once again. I don't feel like just because I didn't outline my job is done, like there's a lot more because Rebecca kept us in the room. We did punch up, we did uh, full rewrites of dialogue passages. It's just who, however the show runner really wants to create that territory and allow that envisionment to like grow and for the, uh, the verbiage to also grow. Because yes, we did know we were doing something that hadn't really been done completely, which is allowing a child to have emotions and be flawed, um, which is another point of pushback that I give to a lot of executives these days, which is, you know, yeah, you're, you're giving me all this money, but what are you giving me all this money for? If you want me to tell the same stories that you've already had on TV, you just play a rerun. But if we want to get serious about the comedy and the gravity of life, then that's what I'm here to give you. Either way, I'm still getting paid for this like five minute meeting that we did for the six hours that I'm going to bill you. And I hope you have a great day. Can I get just that clip, like, second after this as, like, a motivational... Tanika. Yeah, that was beautiful. Doing, like, daily mantra where we all can tune in to you, like... <laughs> Nika, you had me you had me up until you said giving me all this money i don't know what <laughs> you're talking about i know julie we keep having this talk where i'm like if you're not full time you're no time and if it's no time you kiss my ass um <laughs> i love I it come to this business just to to like sit here and twiddle my thumbs and just like be so great right. for all the little opportunities but at the same time i'm here to be funny make funny things happen but I also am very um, real and collaborative and respectful of the other people I work with. And comedy doesn't just come from us, it also comes from our storyboarders. Even when they're pitching the smallest ideas, I'd rather hear them than not hear them. And if I'm not hearing them, then I have someone else I need to talk to. I love that, yeah. Well, that, that beautifully dovetails into another question that I had, um, you know, when it comes to that relationship between the animators and the writers. And of course, on a board-driven show, as you outlined, um, that, and that relationship is tighter than normal because it has to be. Because, you know, if it's just that separation, there's this whole other part of that process that's missing. But I've personally been on a lot of scripted animated shows where it's not so much that the animators were locked away from us, but we didn't have that kind of fluidity. How do you guys feel like, how, how can we design a better tomorrow that would incorporate that fluidity for scripted shows better? Because I feel like the comedy especially is made better in the end by having an understanding between those two factions. I usually write it in. I usually write in mm -hmm. here. I try, like, I'll write in kind of, I might write in some sort of an inspiration sort of thing for this. Like there's some part that recently that I wanted in this script that kind of, I want it to feel like the part in a Christmas story where he's, he can't talk and to, and to Santa. And then he finally is like, I want a red ratchet, you know? And I, I, I was like, I want it to kind of have that feeling, but I, I wrote specific, I, I will write specifically, this is to the board artist's discretion. And that, because my first show was Powerpuff and literally the board artists and I mean, they're like my best friend, we, that whole crew and I are still best, yeah. friends, best friends. And so it was weird to go onto a scripted show and then be like, oh, I don't see who boards it. So on this show, I've really tried to be very clear that this, here's this chunk, I really want them to go with it. And I've actually had people come back to me and be like, well, what do you mean by this? And I'm like, I want you to go ask the board artists 
I want to see what they think. I want to see what their take is on it. And sometimes that's like, I know I did not realize, I actually didn't realize I was like causing a kerfuffle by doing that. Cause I was so used to Powerpuff just being right. like, positive, let's just see what they do. And so then I realized that I was like, okay, I actually just have to kind of stand firm about it and just say, no, no, really trust, trust me. I really want to trust them and see what they do. Cause what they always, they always turn out with something better than what I could, could have come up with in that part. It's like, I have a feel that I want to achieve, but like, I'm not right. a list. <laughs> so. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. It's, it's hard to extract that idea from your brain and be like, don't you know? <laughs> this yeah, is what so I mean. They can, Cause they're always going to level it up. They're always thinking. Right. Okay. So that's, I always try to, I try to build that. I'm finding that I'm build, building it into my script and that the, the weird part was that I found that I have to hold strong to send back to them. That's interesting. I don't try to bind them or pigeonhole them or anything like that. In some instances, I will be vague. I will get it past the executives because I know I can. Because I'm like, <laughs> I know you know where this scene is coming from better than me. And I'm not going to talk to you about your rims. I understand animators speak, but I'm not going to try to teach them their own jobs. Um, but also at the same time, I will do the heavy lifting where it's necessary. Um, it's just a balance. And when you can't talk to them because you know they're in Ireland, um, you just try to leave cookie crumbs inside the script to be like, I trust you. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But if you need me, this is how you can get in contact with me. Or I'll find you on Twitter and we'll just tag and talk in the background. And I'll just be like, hey, you want me to send cookies to the company? Because I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want you guys on my side. Um, even though they're trying to keep me away from you, they can't. Um, I, I love it, that attitude. <laughs> it's just one of those things where it's, it's good to just be human. I mean, there's nothing funnier than being a human. We're like ridiculous creatures to begin with. So you just keep at it. It's going to get funnier. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I think for me also on... I've worked on mostly scripted shows. I worked on one board driven show, but any room I've been in where at least one of the writers was an artist as well is a game changer and is yeah. so helpful. And like, they are like such a, like, like a, per a lighthouse to look at and be like, cause it's like looking for the action of things. I'm looking for, you know, what's going to be funny in drawings and, um, and then also like, what's gonna like, it's not as writers, it's like, oh, it's not just about words. It's about more than that. And you can tell the story yeah. without the words. And, um, and I would like, I think every show should have someone who's an artist and a writer because it's so, so helpful. I've brought yeah. two on board on my own show. Uh, and I'm looking to do it on others and also teaching other storyboarders that they can change into writers. It's, it's not a hidden talent. It's not a secret. Um, if I can do it, trust me, anyone can. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is I should start taking drawing lessons. <laughs> yeah. So uh, horses, they're going to be your new best friend. Just Great. start drawing lots of horses. You're good. <laughs> you're good. Perfect. <laughs> horses are actually the only thing I can draw. Uh, weirdly <laughs> enough. Um, so I'm already great. This is going to be good. Um, since we're talking about, you know, the writer's room and, you know, that kind of balance. I'm very curious for those of you who have been in virtual Zoom rooms um, during this time. And so much of especially comedy writing is based on that chemistry of being in person in a room and sort of pitching jokes and having that rhythm. How has that transition been for you guys? Has there been surprises of how to navigate around it or what have you done? More sharing your screen for YouTube time and dropping gifts in the chat. Yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I think for me, I I think it works incredibly well. Like it, there's we work more often on yeah. Zoom than we do in person. Um, but I also feel really lucky that like the room that I'm in, I already I I knew everyone before we were in a room, and I think it'd be a little bit different if it's the first time that we're meeting. Um, but it works incredibly well. Um, and I mean. It, what I really miss is like the side conversations or like conversations with one person rather than like the whole room um, right. as you like walk to lunch or this and that um, or like, you know, uh, or side eyes. Um, but, but for the most part, like it's really, uh, it's really productive. Um, That's good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remind everyone to stay hydrated and eat snacks. (laughs) Yeah. I think um, I find it very different and I I find it's a lot more difficult for me. Even now, I think I get stage fright on Zoom in a way I don't in a room. Thinking that Mm. if I say something, it'll fill up the whole... I'm already somewhat reticent sometimes to like... I don't like to say ideas until I think I have them somewhat fully formed um and then to to think that that will not only be a thing I say in a room but something that will be on a screen that will like fill the entirety of a screen for a moment is really stressful for some reason for me yeah um I get that and I also just think that the way that the right my favorite writing experiences have all been um in-person uh comedy rooms and there's just like um most of the stuff that ends up going in the script comes from the goofing around in the room there is this weird like we are all stationary at our desks looking at each other um that's going on right now that's like we're not getting the we all took the weird trip to the kitchen to see if the thing would explode in the microwave and then talking about that led to the thing that we're like oh what if that's in this scene like right. and I think that there's a lot of that just sort of lightning in a bottle moment that you can't really uh capture in the same way but with that said I'm very excited and curious for what I think we are going to get out of um the entertainment being created right now and I think that um and I hope that a lot of what it is is we are all for better or worse, completely stewing in our own thoughts. And I think that we're also um, living in a world that's not letting you not take a good hard look at what it is you're putting into it. And um, I think that we're gonna get a lot of projects that come out that are uh, maybe less kinetic, but a, Mm -hmm. a little more thoughtful. And I don't know that for sure, but like, that's what I feel like I'm drawn to writing in this moment. I'm usually somebody who's such like a joke, 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 joke writer. And I'm like, I'm really interested in writing the more like, uh, contemplative, like thing now. Yeah. I love that. That's so great. I, and I agree with Jenny, where it's like, I, I, I found it really hard to convert to the, to this instead of, cause, and luckily our room was like halfway through when we moved to zoom, but yeah, I'm such a like silly joke, this thing, this like snowballed into this thing. And now that's the story and we love it and we can't stop giggling about yeah. it. But that is like my favorite, it like is my favorite thing ever. The, <laughs> the only, I, my reaction though has been opposite where now I only want to write, like I'm going like classic, like I love Lucy kind of stuff where I'm just like, as many jokes as you <laughs> I, love that. I love it. We all respond differently. We do. We do. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I should be writing contemplative shit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I want to. It has just been such a, on every level, uh, brutal year for me yeah. and just like this is where I feel like kind of safe and comfy right now and, like this is yeah like, in and everything I I really believe it's not as much right what you know as it is right what you wish you could be watching mm-hmm. and, and like the, this is the show that I would want to watch right now is like yeah you know, approaching my uh my current projects I love that. I feel like, you know, that just goes across the board of just being surprised by, like, your body and your mind's reaction to this unprecedented time. And I think that, like, just acknowledging that and surrendering to whatever that impulse is, like, that's what it is. If it's silly stuff, like you said, Haley, if it's more contemplative stuff, um, I mean, the first week of Quar, I was like, should I write a Muppet movie? What the fuck? <laughs> like, I mean, just, that's and like, I still should. I mean, first of all, you should. You you Thank really you. should. Thank Second, you. I think that <laughs> I think it is also hard because when you look at what the content of what you're writing, and I guess I this is like a slightly different discussion, but especially if you're looking to 
either write a new pilot or, or do some development or, or whatever it is, um, it's so hard to know what world you're writing for because the right. temptation is to write something set more or less in the year of, in 2019. Yeah. Um, or the temptation is to write something that is set post pandemic, but we don't, we really don't, if I, if we learned anything this year, it is, you don't know what's coming around the corner. So it's like, it kind of boxes you in as far as like, well, what are the things that I want to be writing about? And I had like sort of a, like, I just felt like I couldn't write anything for the first couple months of all this before I started um, using that to sort of, uh, you know, find creative ends to like, okay, well, how do you tell a story that doesn't rely on any of the touchstones of day-to-day -day life? Yeah. yeah, I think that that's like the worthy um, creative develop dilemma to, you know, have those parameters to work around. And at least for me, like, that's sort of been the blueprint for, like, making no pop cultural references that at all reference 2019 or 2020. And, you know, just having it be something that is actually more broad in the end, because, you know, it's, it's not as, like, shoehorned into this corner, which I think makes for better entertainment going forward. Well, it's just crazy how... Um this is like just this thing I've been thinking about how dated absolutely every piece of entertainment is going to, there is going to be a line and it is right. entertainment pre pandemic entertainment, post pandemic. And it, you were just going to like, it's like people are going to look at movies. Like people were high-fiving in this movie. Like that's insane. <laughs> yeah. But there's also this weird thing of like the few things that have come out that are like during pandemic that I'm like, I don't want to watch that. I'm living that. Exactly. Right. It's high it's, it's, because it's what we're all out. living, you know? So I think everyone, like a lot of people who are writing their pandemics uh, pilot, I'm like, I don't want to live in that world once I'm done with it. Oh, oh yeah. No, uh, nobody should be writing anything to do with coronavirus right now. I don't think that's a problem for anyone in here. <laughs> I've, uh, I've eliminated that mostly because I'm like, my show doesn't need pop culture references. It also doesn't need a lot of the usual crutches not saying they're bad crutches that any other show relies on because this is a fantasy show so we can focus on the fantasy here because we're literally inventing the world in a lot of ways and it's great to tell our own stories but then reinterpret them into fantasy ways and not just be like hey the pandemic sucks yeah i know um a lot of things suck right now um so let's try to make things not suck for kids because these are cartoons. Right, right. Just like when you were a kid and things sucked back then, but you don't maybe remember all of it. Like, I don't know about y'all, but I was a kid in the LA riots. So uh, things didn't really suck right then and there. But I also had Captain Planet to go watch. And hey. I remember to cut up the little six pack thing so my sodas wouldn't kill dolphins. You're still teaching lessons. You're still your voice is still something clear to them that's giving them not just a form of entertainment, but a form of the escape they're looking for. And that is kind of our situation. So therefore, we should still be providing that without always letting our adult brain be like, well, I should teach you a lesson about pandemic survival, uh, because that's just not necessary uh, at all angles. Uh, leave that to the edge lords. I really <laughs> believe that the highest calling of all TV writing, like the most noble purpose, is to give the viewer 11 or 22 minutes where they forget they're going to die. And yeah. to me, that is the best, I, that I know that is the way my skill set can heal some part of the world. I do think that's a worthwhile cause, and especially when it's for children. If you can be like, here are 11 minutes where things are safe and like you are safe it's it's a respite um yeah i think that's it's hugely important i know a lot yeah. of writers are going should i quit what i'm doing this doesn't feel as important as it used to but no it has never been more important like please oh yeah we are the titanic band playing as the boat is sinking yeah. and you know i i find that to be actually a very positive thing and not a very negative thing it's not bleak to me it just makes me feel like okay well you know whatever's gonna happen we're gonna entertain the people and i think that's beautiful i think that's all there is 
<laughs> I just think that we're breaking down a lot of barriers. We're able to get away with a little bit more. So maybe in 10 years from now or five years from now, the kids who watch the things that we were making or the things that they got to see on TV are the things that they don't have to fight just as hard as we did for. They can just go ahead and kick down a door and be like, this is the show I want to create. I already saw something half like it, but I'm going to do it better. And I'd rather see that in the next five to 10 years than, you know, just the same old thing that we've been sputtering around with. Right. So it's more inspirational to just keep upping the comedy bar, but opening different avenues for different types of comedy to exist and allowing different types of jokes to land, allowing different types of diversity and culture to be the impactual forces of those uh, moments to actually happen on TV. Uh, I think that's starting to make its uh, effect well known throughout this industry. And I'm just looking forward to what's going to come next for it because it's going to be really hilarious and fun and it's going to speak to me and actually make me laugh finally. I'm sorry. I don't like friends. I didn't get your friends references in all the writer's rooms that I've been in. I didn't like <laughs> Frazier. I didn't grow Tanika, up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, I told you I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, no, uh, that, that was not a jab at Julia. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but it's, it's just, we all grew up from different culture backgrounds, so it's gonna be fun to see those actual cultures finally represented in a way that's not just playing to the formula of, I am insert diversity here. Right. Uh, it's actually just a show that's allowed to flex its muscles and be funny for that audience that it's supposed to be funny for. I love that. I love everything that you just said. And that actually, I mean, I was curious, I was gonna ask, you know, how do you feel like comedy is shifting for the future and I feel like you pretty much just covered that but I'm curious to hear you know specifically within that like what does that diversity and inclusion do to the kind of comedy shows and the kind of comedy that comes from it like we're still making jokes here we're still being silly so and especially with a show like Steven Universe you're tackling you know very tough topics but still injecting humor to that what do you think is the secret sauce to that balance as a comedy writer? Uh, a snow day episode. Everybody needs a snow day. You know, <laughs> it's just, you go with such heavy, hard hitting facts. You got to have something where everybody rewinds, relax, just throws down a good old Steven tag and has a, has a field day. Everybody needs a field day. Everybody needs to be able to just like zonk out and you know what, write your crack fic episodes and let them become reality. It's fine. Somebody's going to appreciate it and be like, oh my God, did you read my fanfiction.net story? Because it very well detailed the same thing that you're showing on TV. No, I didn't. But it was a hilarious idea and I'm happy we were able to share that kismic moment. Um, I think that from Steven Universes and just even Craig of the Creek, as far as being able to play in both of those worlds, there were sandboxes that just were limitless in the opportunities. All we had to do was frame it right. And it mm. was fine. Uh, being able to balance out uh, difficult topics with hilarious topics, again, sandbox, just make that right balance. And everything's fun, and savvy. And everybody's on the same page. I love that. I feel oh, like um, also the, uh, I found out that for when we did Powerpuff, as much as I could bring to that, I brought uh, my, my lessons I learned at Boom Chicago, which was <laughs> to the points that y'all have been making. My first show at Boom Chicago, I had a great first half and then I dropped a Saved by the Bell reference to silence. Uh, to <laughs> <laughs> In a 300 seat theater. People in Amsterdam didn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> it's a reinforcement of my mortality. Um, yeah, so I, uh, that prompted me to really go back to my roots because again, here in LA, you can really, you can, it can really fold in on itself. So I got back to relationships. You know, that who, what, where, like those really simple things. The story for me, it's all, I always bring, I grew up next to, next to a creek. And I, we did, we did a road trip to all lower 48 states with my family. Wow. Literally my mom, we, my, I was just showing my boyfriend the, the pictures and, and there's my mom labeled one, 5,000 miles of pure hell. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I realized that I'm like, you know, it always comes back to the simplest relationship stories and yeah. those, and I realized that, so I went to, I, I dated this 
Chicken Julia knows this, but I, I dated a Chilean man who was married to the sea for a year and a half. <laughs> I went and the all- sky and the sea and the sky. <laughs> and we went to various, I went to a ton of places with him because he was sailing. Anyway, but the thing that I learned was that it was like Powerpuff was crazy successful everywhere I went. I remember I was in the Galapagos Islands and I saw a whole family watching and laughing at it in a restaurant in Galapagos. And I was like, so wild because it, and what it came down to, I had a, like an epiphany moment where, and, and all these other places I went, people love it and love the, even love this version. I know internet. Oh my gosh. They even love this version, but it came down to, this is about these three sisters and Mm -hmm. all the different stuff they do so you translate that into any language and it's still about three sisters doing kids stuff and that was a really cool thing to be like oh you know the times that i really focused on that it played and so i i've really kind of tried to drive back to that with my comedy uh recently yeah i love that i mean that's what right what you know means it's in the truth that you've lived and you know when you have the stories that are true to your life experience and are true to just the human experience, people laugh harder at the jokes. People remember parts of the story more. It's, it's just a surefire win way versus having it all be the external things that I think outsiders to comedy animation writing think that writing cartoons is, you know, it's the talking dog problem. Like, what do you mean? Like, you got to do a talking dog. Talking dogs are funny. That's all you need. The end. And it's like, no, do we care about the talking dog? <laughs> <laughs> to the fireworks. <laughs> I know. When are they? It's always a Simpsons reference. Two seconds away with me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think that that's, you know, it's such a good roadmap of, um, you know, not only writing great stories, but writing great comedy. I want to end on one question and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, this is a very inside the actor studio type question, but I'm curious, um, what is the best lesson that you've learned from your best boss in writing animation? And what is the best lesson that you've learned from your worst boss? Never work for that person again. (laughs) (laughs) That that counts. That's good. Best we'll put their names in the learned. chat. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say it. Best lesson I learned from my best boss. Uh, they're a best boss for a reason. Uh, they have it down to a science. They've definitely labored and struggled, and then they passed it on to me. It felt like a torch. Um, and now I'm kind of like lit on fire and now I'm lighting other people on fire while I'm like running around. That is not a great analogy to use while you're living in California, <laughs> but, um, but it's, we love being on fire. It's, you know, the hometown pride that we're never allowed to have. <laughs> it's passion. And I have a book literally named Elements Fire. So it's like, I can't not think about it because it's something that's really bold and it speaks to me. Um, but also at the same time, it's, uh, it was the lesson that uh, I should never really doubt myself. Um, I guess I didn't even hear my own voice until I got to hear my own voice coming through another person uh, on a screen. And that's something magical. And once you have that magic, it just never goes out. In fact, you just crave it yeah. more and more and more. And from my worst boss, wow. Um, best lesson. Uh, spell check on final draft is nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Tanika, what was the book you said? Huh? You brought up a book. Was that right? Oh, uh, I have an Eisner winning book. Uh, We also won the Ignats for best anthology. Uh, It's called Elements Fire, a comic anthology by creators of color. Uh, We also just came out with Elements Earth, a comic anthology by creators of color. And I also have Beyond the Queer Science Fiction and Fantasy comic anthology and also the post-apocalyptic edition. Uh, We won the Lambda Literary Award, which is the second queerest award next to the Stonewall. Um, We like to make shit that's good. Um, and that's what we should always strive to do. doesn't matter where you're coming from or who you are or where you come or what walk of life you're on. Uh, just do something from the heart. That's always going to hit them hard. Yeah. 
Fuck yeah. I knew I was doing it right when I asked all you guys <laughs> to be a part of this panel. You're making me look good. <laughs> I'll always make you look good. You got the Tom Hanks bathroom. <laughs> Thank you. They didn't need to know that, but now they do. <laughs> now they do. They never told me. That's how you, that's what you live is now. The Tom Hanks bathroom. Yeah. These days, yes. <laughs> I have a, I'll keep it uh, to best boss has a vision. Yeah. And a, and a plan yeah. to follow through on the vision. These two things must both exist. <laughs> but worst boss, uh, what I learned is boundaries. <laughs> boundaries are vital. And a car isn't your friend sometimes. Wait, what was that? I said, and HR. Oh, yeah. Friends sometimes. Yikes. Well, hopefully that changes in the future. That I love that is. I can I piggyback off that one because yeah. I, I love this. Go I Kara. Very similar of like <laughs> best boss is real, especially because like showrunner level is like not only vision, but like delegation mm -hmm. and just being able to communicate expectations yeah. and communicate in general um, is amazing. And worst boss also, uh, HR is not always your friend. And uh, a lot of the stories of Hollywood are true. HR is a liar. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, HR. I know you're here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Why did I ask this? <laughs> so, I'm, I'm going to be analyzing that statement for a real long time. Oh, my God. I have this show to pitch. Is anybody around executives? Hello. It's called HR is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, what about you? Oh, man. Um, I'm like, it's tough. I'm trying to think what the like succinct, succinct ways to put it are. Uh, and also I feel like I've been somewhat lucky on the boss front. I feel like I've learned certain things from not great coworkers who thought they were my boss because of the facts of who I am. And mm. one thing I would really learn is that um and I, I hope is something that everybody already knows uh which is just you can never assume anything about anybody and until they've told you don't don't assume it yeah. um and especially if they're gonna be able to feel safe enough to create in a room with you um and then i think the thing from the best bosses that i've learned is um, assume that people want to give you their best and um, assume that the people who are writing for and with you want to give you their all their energy and your and their best work and if something isn't working it uh, there might be something in the way and you've got to sort of, I'm trying to figure out how to say all these things in really vague ways, but like mm -hmm. to be able to, there was an incident, there was an instance where I was not at my best for a variety of uh, reasons that I, um, and it was apparent one day in the room and um, my boss at the time, um, I, and like I could tell, but uh, that he, he could tell something was wrong and, and he was like, I know that this isn't you. This isn't how you are in the room. I know something's wrong and I want to, I want to be there for you. And, um, it was the best thing because I'm not somebody who would bring something up. Right. Uh, so for him to like be perceptive like that, I think was, was very important. And it sounded like they handled it really delicately in a way it that was, was really it, professional. It did. And this is all sort of, it's all the same sort of uh time period but it was like yeah i'm learning a lot about what to do what not to do mm -hmm. and uh and and, the, and also uh uh know when to know when to fight the note and know when not to and i i really think that when you're a young writer and you're heated and you're getting ready you're like everything i write like i'm gonna push back on every right. note because I wrote it and 
I, I like it. Um, but learning like this is the, this is, you also, you also really do quickly learn the thing of they're giving me this note. I can change this thing. So it's not really changed, but it's changed enough that it looks like I've addressed the note. It is, like, you know, yeah. it's like, <laughs> but you're, you're figuring out like, okay, like here's where I push back. Here's where I don't. Um, and usually to me, it's about content. It's like, if you're pushing back on something that I feel passionately like needs to be a part of that character or, um, or we cannot say this on TV. I do not think that there's a good message right. lesson or whatever. Those are the important battles to fight. And the rest of them, it's like, there'll be another line. There'll be another place you can get that joke in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes me think of, this is, um, uh, like pretty similar to what you were just saying a little different, but when it comes to getting notes from a uh, manager or studio exec, whatever, um, a friend of mine recently told me that those kind of people are good at smelling smoke but not good at putting out fires. And so, you know, that shifted my mindset in how to take in notes that on its surface I would reject. Because a lot of the time, you know, if they're, you know, making notes on my comedy script and they're saying something that is like textbook unfunny, <laughs> your instinct as a comedy writer, at least for me, is to be like, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Beep, boop, bop. I'm going to strut off into the sunset. And then, you know, that comment really made me look deeper into that. And it's made that note process become smoother. And then it has also illuminated the hills I want to die on as to what you're saying, Jenny, of like, no, this has to go in. I'm not going to kill this darling. And I think that having all of those cylinders firing off is um, really important, especially, you know, in comedy writing. No lie, but y'all get some crazy ass notes because I have never got anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, you just wait. You take another five years in this town. You will see it. You will get a note from, listen, no shade, but a young exec who doesn't understand your reference and you go could it be you're very young i'll be like you ready to <laughs> dance kid because i'm 38 and i am feeling great today with my mm -hmm. email skills listen um, <laughs> you text me on that day and i will be there <laughs> let's dance let's dance <laughs> uh Okay, so now we're opening up the floor for the Q&A. We already have a couple questions in the Q&A box. I'm not quite sure how this works. <laughs> uh, Q&A box and we can read the one with the earliest timestamp. Yeah. Patrick, we, we, what do we, you want to do? Uh, so we can have, um, uh, I think, Julia, if you want to uh, uh, just say what the question Answer is. Answer live? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Let's I wasn't sure how it worked. I, I, I know. Um, I think we're figuring it out as we go along. I think if you want okay. to answer it live and then we'll just open it to the, to the group. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So the first question is from Kendall Haney. Um, Kendall writes, thanks so much for taking the time to be here, everyone. Question, do you have advice for action adventure writers who maybe have a bit of imposter syndrome when it comes to writing comedy? Do you have advice for practicing or perfecting the craft and scaring away those self-esteem demons? Does anybody yes. in this room have imposter syndrome? No. <laughs> I do. Oh, um, okay, I'm sorry. So, I spoke for Jenny. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's okay. So I just wanted to say, because it sounds like their imposter syndrome is in part coming from, uh, from the fact that they're an action adventure writer primarily. Um, I just want to say my entire training is in comedy. I have spent at this point uh, 11 years uh, working as a professional comedy writer. Um, every goalpost I've ever set for myself and told myself after that, I will feel validated. I've hit, um, and I still feel imposter syndrome every single day. And I think the best thing you can do is say, uh, you know what? Maybe the thing I should be feeling imposter syndrome about is the fact that I am not the authority on whether or not I can write it seems like a lot of these other people are putting faith in me or telling me good things. Maybe I should listen to them for once. Cause like, I have like, I have such intense imposter syndrome. Uh, and I keep 
I, I will, I feel like I will wait my entire life for somebody to tell me that, uh, that I'm a fraud. But what I really think it comes down to is like, um, I think you create these things in your head and you're like, if I could do that, if I could, you know, if I, uh, if I sold the show, if I, if I, if I got the Emmy nom or whatever it is, it's like, yeah, then I will feel like I've made it. And then you get those things and you're like, I still don't feel like that. Oh shit. Maybe it is always just me with more accomplishments. And maybe I need to figure out how I'm going to feel good about myself outside of career validation. Um, yeah, I still don't have that answer. And if you, if you come up with it <laughs> and email me, that would be great. But I, that, I have an, I have an ad for that. Actually, I have a, I have an addition for that and I'm going to sound like everyone's mother. I love it. Yes. Please. Let's hear it. Mom. Get ready because guess what? Did you get enough sleep last night? <laughs> well, no, no, we're in a pandemic. God, because I have I have deep imposter syndrome as well, and the more over the, this has happened to me very much over the pandemic. I've had moments where like my anxiety or my imposter syndrome, I, like like it's been so bad that my. My buddy Zig, uh, I think some of you guys know Zig, mm -hmm. we were having meetings because we were paired up for a while. And at one point he was like, we left a meeting and he's like, Haley, do you know how to flex? And I was like, oh, and he's like, you have an Emmy nomination. You never remember, remember to say it in the meeting. And I was like, I guess I don't. And it was like, I realized that was me putting all of that in there. And then I realized that a lot of times when I'm getting really wrapped up in my head, and this happened over the pandemic. I was became very clear in my mind one day that I was like, I think I need a good night's sleep. And I am telling you in the morning, if you get a solid eight hours, which we're all bad at, you actually feel a little bit better about it all. Like you can, you can, and you have a, like, it seems like it's the smallest thing, but it's a very yeah. effective thing. Well, I got a solid four last night. See, so, Jenny. No. But also, <laughs> but also I, I don't know if this is universally true and I don't know if the person asking the question gets periods, but I, I don't know if this is universally true of period getters, but I once a month have a day where I hit a serious rock bottom about my career mm -hmm. and it is, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Either it is yeah. I don't have enough going on. I haven't done enough or it's all these things I'm doing. What do they actually mean? They're not going to work out. It, it adjusts, it adjusts to, to be important, but I find myself in actual tears, like uh, over like what a failure I think I am. And inevitably a week later, my period shows up. It is my number one predictor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You gotta remember that your body is like, this is, the, that was really what I kind of got in touch with over during the pandemic was that it was like, I do the same thing. It's just remembering that sometimes your body, I mean, your body's a machine and some, it needs things to keep it going. Did you eat enough? Did you sleep enough? Have you drank enough water? And like a lot of times your mood, it's not all the time, of course, but like it, little things, imposter syndrome and stuff, is it's worth thinking about it. it. Am I if you're a period getter? Am I close to my period? You know, if you right, are, right. if you're somebody like me who will work until they don't realize. Did did you eat? Like I forget to eat sometimes and stuff like that. So I I think that is an important part. It's not everything, but maybe that it's worth to check in with yourself. As if your self esteem, mm -hmm. are you taking care of yourself? Yeah, that's and also so I don't take care of myself. No, I um, <laughs> I'm gonna say for imposter syndrome too is the biggest difference for me, and a lot of this also comes from like improv and sketch background of like the importance of ensemble and other people in my life, and having a good writers group and people who yeah. know me and know my writing and who not only for because like my writers group like yeah we talk about writing sometimes we also just like are a little therapy group for like, I had this meeting and this is how it went. Help me analyze this. Yes. But this yes. happened in the room, I don't understand this. And it's like your way of like helping understand this weird little world that we live in as writers. And it has made all the difference. I feel like I, if I miss that, then the imposter syndrome just like sinks in because I'm going to be in my own little vacuum and I'm going to like create a little black hole of self doubt and a little black hole of how to like, you know, uh, the naysayers were right. Um, but right. they, um, but then you're like, oh, wait, no, people like me. They like my writing. Um, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all these things to protect ourselves, right? And I believe somebody in the chat asked, what is imposter syndrome? It's exactly as it sounds. It's like feeling like you're an imposter, you're a fraud, you know, and especially in a creative career where there are so many people that are traveling to Hollywood, jumping off that bus, you know, trying to make it every single day. I think that it can be, you know, spiked up. Um, as far as like the uh, uh, Kendall's original question of like, I think it's the transition of um, writing action adventure and then, you know, going into comedy, that is its own special brand of imposter syndrome of like, am I deserving of this? Am I talented enough to get this? What I will say as somebody who has chronic imposter syndrome, and again, it wanes by the day sometimes because I'm a period getter, it'll <laughs> change with that as we were talking about. Um, you know, nobody else benefits by you telling yourself that you're not really a writer or you telling yourself that you're not really a comedy writer. Nobody else benefits. Um, I remember when I was in my early 20s and I was an aspiring writer and I had no credits um, and people would say, oh, well, you're a writer. And I would shrink down so quickly. I'd go, oh, but I'm not really, like I felt it in my body. I and feel it took myself me doing that literally like, in this moment. <laughs> Uh, You're doing great. Add, um, as an action adventure writer, you actually see things in a visual conceptive way that a lot of other people don't. So as far as like gag and physical humor is concerned throughout the narrative of the bodies through the animation, you have a higher standing of understanding how those actions might take place. I wouldn't feel like an imposter at all, in fact, writing comedy. Uh, I know a lot of folks who write comedy who know nothing about action and, it, and adventure. So you're bringing your own skill set to the table that somebody is absolutely going to find completely useless regardless of how many gags a minute you throw in, um, that's something that can be punched up in the room. So maybe have a little bit more faith in yourself in the fact that you're coming from that different mindset of comedy and, and go ahead and just still go to town with it. Be ham and yeah. don't Definitely. really feel ashamed anymore uh, just because it's not uh, some verbal comedy that's being digested or or, or repeated, reverberated throughout the script. You're, you're good. Yeah. Uh, just give yourself that space and that freedom to continue to work and spec out or even just like uh, feel out how those characters interact with each other. Because I bet it's actually funny as hell. You just haven't had anybody who's either gotten to see it yet or, or responded to you with the same exact thing I just said. Yeah. yeah, I worked on yeah. a life-changing meeting with a showrunner. Uh, it was a, like a meeting on a show uh, that I didn't get, uh, but it was still changed my life. And he was talking about how every, he was a musical theater background, and he said, you know, every musical theater actor thinks they're a triple threat, dancer, singer, actor. But the truth is everyone's something first, something second, and something third. And yeah. he goes, for mm -hmm. writers, there's three things, structure, character, and jokes. What are you first, what are you second, and what are you third? And I was like, and then as a writer, then being able to always strengthen the thing you feel least strong on. But it's not all about jokes. Structure and, and the story is the most important thing. Character, also the most important thing. Jokes, yeah. I think, are like the lesser important thing because those are so replaceable. How dare you? That is... That's a pie in the face, right? I mean, no, 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 like, yeah. It can be so replaceable. And like, For sure, they're the frosting like, on the cake. And the best joke writers are writing jokes that are integral to the story and integral right. to the characters and specific to the characters. It's not just like, oh, I just wrote jokes all day. It's like, no, no, I, they were very specific for the structure. They were very specific for the characters. But all three threats are needed within the room to create a good ensemble. I love that. That is amazing. Yeah, and I was going to say that, you know, like you... To piggyback off of what everyone's saying, you truly don't know what instrument you play in that band. So maybe you don't even know what your triple threat order is, but you walk into the room and to just like harness that confidence and be like, I'm gonna play this instrument, more often than not, other people are gonna identify what that is. They're gonna go, oh, that's a you joke, or oh, that's a you pitch. And you'll be like, is it? And maybe at first you'll be offended. <laughs> I am sometimes, I'm like, is it? Um, but then that's just, you know, them identifying what your um, instrument is. And yeah, I want to also echo writers groups are so important. Um, uh, I'm in a writers group right now that has changed my life. And just having, you know, that group support like during this time, but then just in general, I think that, you know, you need that because if your only interaction with other writers or other people that do what you do is in a professional setting, you're not going to get 
the kind of support and inspiration that you need to get the job done and, and really grow as an art artist. So yeah. I'm a loser. <laughs> I only have my wife. I tell her my jokes. She thinks I'm funny. That's why she married me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have a writer's group. So I mean, writer's group, amen, bless them. But uh, uh, I just kind of go at it alone and maybe send my best friend some really terrible non-contextual thing and they'll be like yeah that wasn't funny bro and i'll be like that's, oh, that's good shit. too though that's, that's your group my script and cry in a corner that's that's that counts as a group too i will say <laughs> oh one person julia one person yes. the whole group <laughs> yes it's a group it's more than one okay um <laughs> moving on to the next question danny ducker asks what is your best advice for a board artist who is interested in writing? I had an unnamed exec at an unnamed studio brush me off when I asked about how to become a writer at said studio, despite having been on a board driven show there. I ain't saying anything, Danny, but I know everything. Um, <laughs> Danny, uh, a really great way to get started uh, as a writer is to actually write. Uh, go ahead and start pulling up all the information that's provided on writer's Twitter uh, in the writer section on the LGBTQ um, Writers Guild, uh, even in the, uh, the black and animated discord that's available. There are so many great writers resources. Um, decide which venue you're trying to go to, if it's scripted or if it's board driven. Um, it's good to learn script. Uh, I boot camped myself through it in three months and I, I learned how to do it and got a job. So I believe in you. Um, but also uh, I feel like if you have any questions, go ahead and just reach out to me. You know my personal email. But also don't feel stunted by that wild executive who kind of tried to block you off. Uh, they come and go. Uh, but it's about the relationships you make with other people. Uh, but learn your basics, learn, learn about the writing format, learn about what you're diving into, and then start seeking jobs in that field primarily. Uh, I literally just hired a board-driven artist uh, for a show as their first writing gig. And you know what? They're kicking ass. So uh, trust me, things are changing. I'm sorry it's been so slow, uh, but, but you shouldn't let that person uh, demean you or make you feel like you yeah. can't do this. It's, I love that. It's hard with the gatekeepers because you give them so much authority and they do have so much authority, but I always go to, don't let anyone tell you who you are if they don't know you. <laughs> they only have oh, so much authority until the next network merger. Exactly. <laughs> also, I always try to remind myself whenever somebody does something like that, I'm like, just always remind yourself, everyone has their own personal motivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something and sometimes it's it's nothing to do with you and it's everything to do with that like this is classic kind of exact stuff is like this person's a really good board artist if i make them think they can move over to writing i lose a really good board artist yeah they, they have a motivation like that's mm -hmm. it's, it's always worth checking back because i was I was like a pinball when I first moved here because people, people were fucking with me left and right. Like they just wanted me to really doubt myself. There was a lot of people that wanted me to doubt myself for various reasons that all had to do with themselves. And a lot of times that is like the, those pe people want you to stay in a way because then they don't have to think about you. Then they don't have to do the extra yeah. work of doing anything about that. So put that person out of your mind because almost certainly they were driven by a different motivation. And then if you want to do more writing and you want to do comedy, I, yeah, I would suggest watch, watch your favorite show and break it down. How did, like, how did they get there? How did they get there? And, and you know, what, where are the act breaks? Uh, you can look those up on all sorts of free tutorial sort of things and then go back. I always rewatch the same episode of The Simpsons when I'm in a writer's block because it's like a perfectly written three act structure and it always makes me feel like better about, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, yep, I can which, do it. Which one, which one? Fielder, how I learned to stop worrying and start, lovely, start loving legalized gambling. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, I have uh, two things. The, the first is that it would be so much easier to go from being a board artist to a writer than writer to board artist because I can't draw for shit. Mm -hmm. I'm in awe of board artists at all time and I love being in animation so I can hang around and try and get them to draw me into the background. Um, I really feel like 
but like I, I truly, I think like if you're a board artist, you have a sense of structure innately. You have a sense of of visual gags. You have a sense of of that process. So this executive was, as Haley said, doing some kind of machinations of their own to try and prevent you from keeping you down, benefited them in some way. And then as far, so I used to do a, and still do a lot of like, if there are, I will be paired up as a writer with a board artist if they're trying to develop a show, because I think structure is one of my like, uh, stronger suits. And the number one thing that I say to board artists or that I see board artists do that I'm always like, here's where I would uh, advise you to think is that they're so creative and so visual and so good at world building that get what gets lost in that sometimes is the, the really basic thing of the want. Um, every character that you write wants something everything that happens to them exists to either serve or um or uh prevent them from getting that want and if you can just pare down your story and tell me none of the other world building details and just tell me that tell me every point along that line there are like more intricate things about structure and and again like you can find those guides out there and um it's really not that hard like just map map an episode over an episode of tv that you like it almost inevitably the episodes of tv that you like are the ones that are well structured um but just just like just find that really specific thing they want what does it mean to them what is against them what is for them and that's yeah. the, the barest, barest bones of a show. Love it. I will, and also as a storyboard artist on a, um, on a storyboard driven show, in my experience that they, you do all, you do so much writing already. So yeah, I think the whole writing. Writing is bunk, like just, and I, it goes back to like uh, what Tamika was saying of just like, write, uh, take a class, mm -hmm. uh, get a book, um, write a spec, write a pilot, write something, write a short story, write an article, anything that shows that like I can put words on paper and not just on storyboards because it's the same thing and you're already doing it and don't listen. Yeah, yeah, there and, and I always recommend even though um, it may be a little bit harder virtually, um, but if you wanna make stuff and you wanna meet other people who are making stuff and are just as hungry as you, I always recommend Channel 101. They are continuing to do their monthly screenings virtually on Twitch, I believe. Um, but they have a, a great Facebook community. So, and they do a lot of animation. People like Brian Weissalls come from uh, Channel 101. Mike Chillian, whose show just dropped on HBO Max. Tig and Seek, um, which is lovely. Go watch it. Um, but yeah, you'll find other people that are in a similar position um, as you. And it's a, a really great cheerleading corner of people just rooting on great ideas and, you know, experimenting and exploring and all that good stuff. I, um I, yeah oh sorry right. um i think uh i completely lost my train of thought and i'm so it's sorry okay. i had it i had it's had okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have another question julie yeah 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 um do you have advice for developing strong character motivations and letting those emotions develop the story mm -hmm. kind of have been you kind of just answered that actually, Jenny. <laughs> oh, I mean, the, I think that when you create a character, innate in any character is the thing that they want. Um, and the, the difficulty is externalizing that want. So like, I feel like when I, when you go to a lot of early writing classes, they'll ask you, well, what do your character want? And they'll say, well, well, they want to be happy or, um, you know, they want to be successful, but that's not, um, that's not you can't externalize you have to externalize that yeah. so then it becomes okay my character wants to be happy to them happiness looks like this in order to achieve that version of happiness they have to do this thing they want this thing that is like the kind of cleanest line there like um you know l woods wants her ver L legally blonde perfectly structured film 
Elle Woods wants her perfect life. She wants her perfect boyfriend. She wants her perfect, uh, like, looks. She wants all of that. In order to get that perfect life, she has to have what she thinks is the perfect guy. In order to have that perfect guy, she has to go to Harvard. So she mm-hmm. wants to graduate from Harvard Law. And it's like, you're just extrapolating out. I mean, the the big Lebowski, the dude just wants his rug. He just wants right. competition for his rug. Shrek wants his swamp back. Yeah. But those are all, you know, those are all like, clearly that is not the whole story. It's just like. Winnie the Pooh yeah. just wants honey. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, I, I, oh, I was gonna say, um, as far as like animation TV goes, I always think of it as kind of a double decker bus where there is the show want. Mm-hmm. So, say, you know, with Gravity Falls, the show want is to have this like, you know, bonding normal corner of a very not normal world and trying to make sense of it and trying to collect clues of it. And then you have the episodic want that's on like the lower level of the double decker right. bus. So the episodic want is going to be the more specified want, but it's always going to service the, the top tier. And you could even do this with like SpongeBob. Like SpongeBob wants everybody around him to be happy and he wants to be friends with everybody. And then you have the episodic want, which is like, in order to get that, he's going to compete in, you know, a a beach body competition and he's going to do the big blow up thing so that Sandy can, you know, see that he's cool. And it's just like like that double decker bus. The cleanest version of this is Pinky and the Brain because they see it. Yeah. They want to take over the world. They want to rule the world. But in that episode, one episode, it might mean we want to make it big as country singers. You know what I mean? Like... It's um, yeah, and if you and I, if you oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I I was gonna say even if you uh like would like to develop a more uh nuanced like you're looking for more nuanced wants for example if it's like oh man every time I hear these like when I first yeah. first like I'd be like I'd hear that want and then I'd try to like then suddenly all my characters would start to do that which is totally fine that's a part of the process of writing if you're trying to move. If you're trying to, uh, you know, find different ones, something I did, because I started in acting, I didn't start in writing, and I've been on, like, I still dip back and do shows and stuff every once in a while, but something, uh, A, an acting class can always be helpful if you're really stuck, because that is all about finding a want in a scene, and even if you suck at acting, you really, you learn how to feel it in your body when something doesn't somebody doesn't want something like I now am very intuitive with writing where I'm like I know if somebody doesn't want something because I'm like I'm the character I'm doing yeah another thing you can do is a really simple thing for your uh, during your day stop when you're in the middle of something and ask what you're wanting to do and what you're doing and what you're doing to achieve it and check in with yourself and then look at people around. Are they doing that? Like everybody does have a want and they just to Jenny's point from earlier, everybody has a want in their day-to-day life. So if you're looking to even nuance it down to like, okay, the smaller and smallest stuff, look at people just in their day-to-day life. This guy wants to get out across the street because I see that he, he, there's a bakery there and he seems hungry. Like that sort of thing. You can get that small and that sort of thing, especially. I, yeah, I, go for it. I think one thing that speaking to that and like the nuance of, of wants and everything, um, Parks and Rec is a show where every character is playing the, their game every single time they speak. Every time every character on the show opens their mouth, they are saying something that is, and there are a lot of shows do this, but that show always sticks out to me because they are like, by the book, Mike Sure shows do this, um, where um, every line a character says is an opportunity to get to know that character better. And I think that that is such a smart guidepost. Like, Mm -hmm. in this line, my character's only saying hi. But do they say hi? Do they say hello? Do they say, like, good evening? Like, like, yeah, those are uh, such great specific things where, like, getting, you can get so much information to something like that. Um, Yeah, I, that makes me think of, um, when I'm like going through one of the last passes of a script, I try to eliminate the empty calorie lines or like punch them up and like broaden out and include that history of that character or something else that's going to be that extra flavor. And I often think that, you know, (laughs) 
thank God I'm a comedy writer. Thank God it's been able to work out, you know, um, because I feel like, especially when it comes to storytelling, it, it's really hard. There's a minefield out there of telling exposition without it being expository, right? Like we all know that like the Ed Wood, like Tommy was so like, you know, school of bad writing is just like, you know, characters saying, I want to do exactly this. And it's, there's no flavor to it whatsoever. The gift of the comedy writer is folding that into a joke or folding that into- You can't just into... have your character say how they feel. That makes me feel angry. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> if you make it, you make it a joke, <laughs> it's, I think, better. And, and it's sort of like that close-up magic trick that I think comedy writers have in their pocket of being yeah. able to be like, ha I tricked you. I made you laugh, but then I made you think. <laughs> But it's also like, I love that what you say, like the last pass that you do, because like, I remember one of the best lessons I got early on was like in multicams where it's like, if any one joke could be said by any other character, yeah. don't write that joke. Every line of dialogue should be specific to that character. Um, and the other thing I was gonna say just about, cause we talk a lot about wants and like, for me, it's always, I, going off like watching people in real life, I once went to like a self-helpy thing. It was like living your life is story. And the guy was talking about like, okay, I went to like Robert McKee's thing and he was talking about how good story is about a character who wants something and overcomes conflict to get it. And I sat there, this was like five minutes into the self-help thing. I was like, well, that's bullshit. Cause to me, especially if your life is stories, like it's a character who wants something, who overcomes conflict to get what they need. That may yeah. or may not be what they wanted in the first place. Cause like, like Shrek, Shrek wants his swamp back, but he wants to be left alone. But he doesn't need that. He needs community and he needs- yes. A significant other and like there's there's other needs at play and that gives us more of an arc than just saying like I'm gonna want something and then I'm gonna get it that is uh, I mean there's and there's great stories that do that but I think that the deeper you can go with like I wanted one thing and that got adjusted I think Elle Woods is another great example her her needs adjusted her wants by the end of Legally Blonde even though she got what she wanted yeah I'm so glad that you said that go ahead <laughs> Haley really writing down everybody's stuff I'm like this <laughs> <laughs> but Kara, I was I was gonna say that that want versus need thing, man, that is like the ace in the hole for any pitch doc too. When you're writing out a pitch, I think especially for animation, you know, you're going into the profiles of all the characters. And I think that what elevates a good pitch from a great pitch is identifying what they want is this, which is like their short-sighted, almost petty want. And then what they need is what is going to be the whole fucking show, bitch. <laughs> so you can be like six seasons in a movie just immediately in that pitch doc. Totally. At least for me. That's mm -hmm. what I think. Yeah. Cool. Do we have any other questions? I don't see any in the Q&A, but if anybody wants to jump in. What do you think, Patrick? I think that might be it. I mean, we've, we've okay. gone, you know, we've gone uh, an hour 45. That's really good panel wise. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and bring this one to a close. Um, do, you, do you guys want to just do a, a quick sign off and that'll be, that'll be it? Sure. Um, I'll just start. Uh, Julia Prescott. <laughs> uh, you can find me online. I'm at Julia Prescott and all the things. Um, uh, you know, I usually just uh, retweet other nice things that are on the internet. <laughs> and, and I don't know, hire me. I'm available. <laughs> what about you guys? Uh, I'm Tanika Stotts. You can find me at TanikaStotts.com. Currently on a social media break because it's terrible. Um, yeah, but you can also good. find me at my first and last name at all the same websites because it's unique and I'm not named Mary or Jane or Kate. <laughs> no offense to any Mary Janes or Kates, but man, y'all got it rough out there these days. <laughs> uh, I'm Kara Lee Burke. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at, at Burke Noe, B-U-R-K-N-O-E, because everyone misspells my last name. <laughs> and I also have a website, um, KaraLeeBurke.com, also still with no knee E. Uh, and yeah, uh, I do also teach classes, um, but I'm not teaching right now. So, um, yeah, follow me on, uh, social media to find out when I do those in the future. Um, I'm at, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm HaleyMancini.com. I got a site. Uh, and I'm also at Haley Mancini on 
various things. Uh, and uh, hey, I got a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got a Godzilla podcast. Oh, a Godzilla podcast. It's called Godzilla versus, or no, it's called Podcast versus. Oh my God. Well, everybody, everything, this has been fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she lost it right at the end. Godzilla versus Podcast Zero. We just have other comedians talk about our favorite Godzilla movies. It's very silly. Um, but yeah, I've been told it's fun. So, you know, listen if you want. <laughs> uh, I'm at Jenny Jaffe on everything. And um, I'm always happy to just sort of be a resource to um, any aspiring writers. And I have open DMs and um, my time is limited. So if it takes me a long time to get back to you, um, I, I apologize. But I really do um, love talking about this stuff and am somewhat more comfortable over text too. So <laughs> feel free yeah. to Oh, I wanted to add one more thing because we teased it up top. Uh, I do host a monthly lecture series that is very much like what tonight was. Um, we're just starting to do it virtually. So um, if you want to be added to the mailing list to find out when the future ones are, um, email jplectureseries at gmail. I think uh, the next couple ones on the horizon are going to be focusing on what's it like to pitch during COVID? <laughs> what's it like to make stuff during COVID? And then other things, blank, blank, COVID. Because what's happening right now? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I look forward to seeing you all there. And thanks so much for having me as the moderator, Patrick. Of course. I, I just want to second that. Thank you all so much for being part of this tonight. Uh, I know that a lot of people on, on here got a lot out of it. And um, we really appreciate your time. Well, thank have a great, have a great weekend. So for much. That was an attendee. Thank you so much. Good night. Yay. Thanks.